Our next speaker, <laughs> applause again, of course, yes. The next speaker is uh, from South Korea, Dr. David Kang, and he will speak about the preferred mm, choice. Let me see this here. The preferred uh, choice for myopic presbyopia patients combining the presby marks with Calex. Thank you, Professor Conan. Uh, my name is David Kang, and I have been asked to talk on uh, my preferred choice for treating a myopic presbyopic patient by combining corneal wavefront guided presbymax in the near eye with Clex in the dominant eye in a 50-year-old uh, presbyop. These are my financial uh, disclosures. Of course, I consult for Schwind. And of course, presbyopia is what it's all about. Uh, in a young eye with clear crystalline lens and strong zonules looking great, it ages, it thickens, and the zonules weaken and we get presbyopia, whose treatment modalities can be lens-based. There are numerous excellent multifocal eye wells out there, the EDOFs with micromonovision, with ever-increasing technology minimizing all these photic phenomena, and there are no science for these lenses to be placed in the eye for more than five decades. So for the 40s, the science isn't there to rule out retinal detachment without a previous PVD, ERMs, late decentrations, and such. For corneal-based treatments, there are the inlays, and we know where they all went. <coughs> Even after their removal, uh, we have some very unhappy patients. Laser vision correction then. There is traditional monovision. It is usually unaccepted by the visual cortex due to large amounts of anisometropia between the dominant and non-dominant eyes, which we use now. Minute amounts of micro anisometropia and modulating the corneal spherical aberration at the same time, using the interocular rivalry between the dominant and non-dominant eyes, and also using bilateral, binocular, neural summation, which of course brings us to Presby Max. Now, this classification shows that there are actually three iterations of Presby Max when there is actually only one. It is just confusing the user. It is all, if you look at what the laser is doing to the near eye, it's exactly the same for all three iterations. It is what you're doing to the dominant eye that is slightly different, but actually it's the same. It's a matter of titrating the induction of negative spherical aberration into the dominant eye. Now, of these three, my favorite by far is Presbyvax monocular, where we set for emotropia, the distance eye, and for the near eye, we introduce minus 0.89 diopters of sphere, which is not enough for near vision. So we induce negative spherical aberration, which depending upon the prescription add of the eye and the amount of spherical equivalent, equivalent of the patient. So you don't get to decide it, the eye does. And using bilateral LASIK, we published this in the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery in early 2023. So you see, spherical aberration enhances edge detection in a fogged eye. This particular aberometer, the promise from CSO, can simulate images of certain defocus and show what each aberration can simulate. So this is an optotype image of corneal wavefront optical quality from the promise without negative spherical aberration in a minus 125 fogged eye. Now we're gonna put in spherical aberration and now we see that the edge detection is much enhanced. This is more obvious if we see them side by side. So the influence of spherical aberration on the depth of field is now quite obvious, but this also is pupil dependent and we will see that a little later. So consider the top row of increasing amounts of myopic defocus and let's take a look at minus 150. Without spherical aberration, there is much blur, but with spherical aberration, the edge detection is much enhanced which is, very thankfully, to the 
uh, the, the particular characteristics of this particular aberration, which is a natural function of our, the human visual system. But the brain doesn't really have to fuse the, these two images from the dominant and non-dominant eyes by bilateral neural summation, the process of bilateral summation, not so different images are processed in the visual cortex. Remember, we're doing CLEX, and CLEX doesn't really induce a lot of spherical aberration. This is a far cry from traditional monovision when these two very different images need to be fused, numbing the visual cortex, causing cross blur, and eventual unacceptance. So what actually is the laser doing to the near eye? Let's just input zero, zero. The target is set for minus 0 0.89, so the laser is now doing a hyperopic ablation for plus 0 0.87. There is a donut-shaped ablation pattern, starting from two millimeters in diameter, increasing at three, and continuing to six. This accounts for the shaping of the negative spherical aberration, both primary and secondary spherical aberrations. And a post-op topography of the MS-39 shows marked changes of Ks in the mid-periphery compared to center. It shows anterior elevation on the corneal vertex and subsequently epithelial thinning in, in the area of anterior elevation. And of course, the induction of negative spherical aberration on the corneal vertex. Difference maps show more change in the mid-periphery in the tangential curvature maps as well as the stromal thickness map. So you're actually, from myope, you are ablating more in the mid-periphery than in the very center, as we saw. But the amount of negative spherical aberration induction as a function of pupil size is very, very important in these cases. At a three millimeter pupil, the negative spherical aberration in a postal eye has been induced to be a minus a quarter. At four millimeter pupils, the negative spherical aberration has been increased to a minus a third. At five, it drops back down to a minus a quarter, and at six, to minus one tenth. And at a seven millimeter pupil, it is now being converted to positive spherical aberration. And looking all these from side to side, the negative spherical aberration is greatest at the four millimeter pupil. This, ladies and gentlemen, is because this corresponds to the myotic effect, which is less touched by my presbyopia, giving the best near visual acuity at this particular pupil size. And ever since that previous publication, we have been doing full correction with CLEX in the distant eye for the near eye, the same thing, total corneal wavefront guided presbymax LASIK, aiming for 0 0.89 uh, of, of sphere. If we look at the demographics of, of this study, which was just under 100 patients consecu consecutively enrolled from May and June this year. So these results presented here today are the three months results, just under 100 patients, 96 patients. The average age was 50. The bracket, I call this the golden bracket, it was from the age of 46 to 56. Too early for lens-based treatments, just right for Presby Max. Both eyes were on average about minus three and a half diopters, and the non-dominant eye, th the given ad, on average was about plus one and a half. The planned optical zone for CLEX was just under 6.4 millimeters, but in the, in the non-dominant eye for Presby Max, I went for a very big optical zone, 7.2. If you see the refractive outcomes are very excellent at three months, the dominant eye showing 0.01 logma. So the spherical equ equivalent was very acceptable. And not surprisingly, the TBUT on the CLEX eye, the distance eye, was longer than the LASIK eye. Efficacy at three months for distance vision, unaided distance vision for the near eye, 83% of the near eye was seen better than 2063, unaided. 35% was seen better than 2040. Unaided distance vision for the far eye, 100% was seen better than 2020, and 12% was seen better than 2016. But this is monocular data. And Presby Max is actually a functional bilateral procedure. Safety, again, monocular. 
Dominant eye distance vision, corrected distance vision, 21% gain lines, 2% loss one line. Non-dominant eye, near eye, corrected distance vision, 17% eyes lost a line, yes. But what is important is binocular vision. And this is published data in 2023. We published in JCRS with bilateral LASIK. 100% of binocular were seeing distance vision 2020. Near vision, 100% were seeing J2. With CLEX and LASIK combination for the three month follow up, again, 100% were seeing binocular cumulative vision better than 2020. Near vision, 100% J2, 82% J1. And in a three dimensional representation of this, 22 and J2, that was 100%. 82% of these patients, of these 96 patients, were seeing 2020 and J1. 2016 and J2 above was 10%. Predictability was excellent, as is ex expected for CLEX and LASIK. And for the corneal eye order aberration, let's look at the inductions. For the distant side, remember it was CLEX. Spherical aberration was slightly reduced, but this does not reach significance, so it didn't really change from pre-op. Near eye, the corneal wavefront guided LASIK eye, we induced about 0.4 diopters of negative spherical aberration. Coma, for the distance eye, increased because it is current, it is, the, the CLEX does increase coma. For the near eye, it actually decreased in coma because we were doing corneal wavefront guided surgery. Binocular defocus curves, for Presbymax, and if you see from 0.1 logma and between 0.2 logma, all the way down to minus three and a half sphere. And we, if you compare this with published data uh, that was published by our distinguished moderator for multifocal various IOLs, we can see the beauty, the excellence in between the ages 46 and 56 of the human crystalline lens. So in conclusion, Presby Max in the non-dominant eye combined with CLEX in the distance size is safe and effective for the management of presbyopia in this population. Longer TBUT in the CLEX distance eye um, signifies less dry eye. Thank you very much. Excellent, excellent. Can you uh, can you tell the audience what is your plan for these patients later when they when they develop, uh, let's say, cataract formation? You most likely have already some of them. So what what do you do then? Well, the dominant eye is is a CLEX eye, so it's no real big problem. But the non-dominant eye has negative spherical aberration induced on the cornea, so it's not a very good idea to implant an IOL with negative spherical aberrations, such as the Technis platform, or even the Panoptics, Clarion platform. These have between, I think, minus 0 0.27 to minus 0 or 0.18 of spherical aberration. You will be inducing toxic amounts of ocular spherical aberration, negative. Instead, because, because the eye is already seeing well, I would target minus 0 0.89 diopters of myopia in the dominant eye and implant a neutral, a spherical aberration neutral, or even a positive IOL to conserve what the cornea is actually doing to that patient's presbyopia. And in the dominant eye? The dominant eye is a CLEX eye. It has neutral spherical aberration. Uh, it can be implanted with any IOL that you wish. Excellent, excellent, They're very good. So are you concerned, uh, because you know, you, you found our papers also, and in the German literature, at least with the presbyopia correcting, there was a loss of best corrected visual acuity distance. You have not seen this. You have seen this? Yes, in the non-dominant non eye, we saw 17% of these eyes assessed monocularly were losing one line of vision, distance vision, uncorrected, uh, corrected distance vision, but presby max is a binocular functioning procedure and not a monocular procedure. And that's why binocular cumulative vision showing 100% of these patients showing better than 2020 is what I think what's important. That's, that, that's great because, and, and I understand correct, you use two different technologies, Calex and 
That's transpiric or it's uh, surface ablation. LASIK. 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 LASIK okay, yeah. that's that's okay. Good. Sorry, uh, but but sometimes to ask again it makes makes it clear for everybody. So it's a combination between KLEX and LASIK. Yes, sir. Maria, that's a KLEX and LASIK combination. So I'm then. Sorry <laughs> for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Super talk. Thank you very much.